Tonight, uh, we're starting a class on world eschatologies. Eschatology. Eschatology comes from the ancient Greek. Eschatos, which means last, and what we would call logi or oluia in Greek, study of. So the study of the last things. So it concerns expectations of the end, usually of the present age, sometimes of human history, sometimes of the world, sometimes of the cosmos itself. So these are various elements of eschatology. So just as all the major religions have creation stories, how things began, dealing with the beginning of all things, so they all have their end time narratives. So, uh, some treat eschatology as a future event that's prophesized in texts or in folklore. Some see it in terms of uh, concepts of renewal or transformation through personal visions. So there's all sorts of sources for eschatology, but the main sources remain scriptural, at least interpretations thereof. So over the next four weeks, I'm going to be examining eschatological themes as found in Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and then we'll put Hinduism and Buddhism together. So by, by the end of this class, you should know a lot about the end, or hopefully so. Okay, the first of these, they're known as the Abrahamic religions. Okay, that's Judaism, Christianity, Islam. They maintain what we call a linear cosmology. Beginning, middle, end, like a line. Although lines have no beginning and end, so I'm told. But uh, for practical use, beginning. So that's what the Abrahamic religions have in common. The Dharmic religions, or the Indian religions, tend to have cyclical worldviews. So they see things in terms of circles rather than straight lines. And so the eschatologies vary to some degree just according to that very basic way you look at life or the cosmos. Did the cosmos have a beginning, a middle, and an end? Or is it always here going round and round? So those are some of the two base. So tonight, we're going to start with Jewish eschatology. Remember, eschatology is a good word to know for a dinner party. <laughs> you know, as you're, as you're there have, sipping your wine, you, and what, what, what do you think about uh, Christian eschatology? <laughs> and if they kick you, well, <laughs> so in any case, so... Jewish eschatology is that area of Jewish theology concerned with events that will happen at the end of either a historical period or history as a whole. Okay? So that's that linear view. In Judaism, the end times are usually referred to as the end of days. The end of days. A phrase that appears several times in the Tanakh, which is the term for the Hebrew Bible. The Torah is the first five books, but the Tanakh is the entire Bible, which includes the other sections. So these events include the ingathering of what are known as the diaspora Jews, that is Jews who have been in exile for one reason or another. That's one of the ancient themes from their ancient uh, homeland. The coming of the Messiah is the second, the resurrection of the dead, and the final judgment. So those are some of the four major sub-themes of Jewish eschatology, and we're going to be looking at those tonight. So the main tenets of Jewish eschatology are elaborated in these books, the book of Isaiah, the book of Jeremiah, and the book of Ezekiel. So Isaiah and Jeremiah are referred to as the pre-exilic prophets, meaning pre-exile, before the Babylonian captivity. Indeed, they are warning the Jews of their times of the disaster that is coming. So they're pre-exilic. Whereas Ezekiel is an exilic prophet. In other words, he lived during the Babylonian captivity. 
In addition, there's something called Deutero-Isaiah, which are chapters 40 and 55, through 55 of the book of Isaiah. It's believed when written by a separate author. Although it is under Isaiah, most scholars see that that was written separately, and it was um, also written during the uh, exile. So an example of an end of day story is found in Ezekiel and is referred to as the war of Gog and Magog. It's a prophecy of a climatic war that will happen at the end of the Jewish exile, at the end. Gog, G-O-G, is an individual and Magog is his land. So it's usually Gog from Magog. The meaning of the name Gog remains uncertain, not quite sure. And the author of the Ezekiel prophecy, whether it was Ezekiel or someone else, seems to attach no importance to who Gog actually was. Might just be a mythical figure, okay? Uh, efforts have been made to identify him with the king of Lydia in the seventh century BCE, but most scholars don't think that Gog was a historical person, more of a mythological character. Uh, in Genesis 10, if you're interested in pursuing this very interesting issue, Magog is described as a grandson of Noah. Although there is no mention there of a person named Gog. Now the name Magog, most scholars believe, although it's rather obscure, is probably associated with Assyria. And Babylon was part of the Assyrian Empire. So that's the connection. So the Gog may be derived from Magog, and Magog may be a code name for Babylon. Okay. Just like a lot of code names were used for Rome by the Protestants. Okay. So it may be a code name for Babylon. Uh, now the home of Zoroastrianism, do you remember a little bit of Zoro, the dualistic religion? was another Babylonian connection. So Gog may well refer to this evil force known as Ahriman. In Zoroaster, there's the good force, Ahura Mazda, always fighting the evil force, Ahriman. This would be the equivalent of the devil. So there's probably some association with Gog with this negative force might have come out of Zoroastrian connections. But anyway, it's used by in, in this prophecy. So in any case, Ezekiel records a series of visions received by, who, he was a priest at Solomon's temple, who was among the captives taken to Babylon. So he's in Babylon during the exile when he has these visions. The exile, he tells his fellow captives, is God's punishment on Israel for turning away. But God will restore his people to Jerusalem when they return to him. Constant theme in the uh, Hebrew Bible. Return, return, repentance, return. It's constant. Even the great heroes like David I mean, some of the things he does. <laughs> but there's always this notion of repent and return. So the idea that uh, the Jews as a people, if they repent and turn back, then things will be back to uh, a good situation. So uh, after this message of reassurance in the vision, uh, chapters 38 through 39 are called the Gog Oracle, G-O-G. And they describe how Gog of Magog and his horde will threaten the restored Israel. So it says, the Jews will return, Israel will be restored, but Gog and Magog will threaten it. So he, it's quoted from, the, from Scripture. Son of man, direct your face against Gog of the land of Magog the prince and leader of Turbal, which was the province, 
and the prophecy concerning him, say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I am against you, Gog, the prince, the leader of Tubal. So you can take it literally that there will be some sort of army invasion. Or if it's metaphorically, Gog represents that return to the ways that got you in trouble in the first place. Okay? Turning away from, from God and his message. So, the, uh, in the end, Gog will be destroyed, after which Gog will, uh, God will establish the new temple and the people will dwell the, in there in peace. So that can be seen as a sort of end story, right? It's the end story of the Babylonian captivity. This is how it will end, with a warning. Gog will be there, but Gog will be defeated. And you can take that literally or metaphorically. Uh, so the God prophecy isn't the end of the world sort of eschatology, but an event that would usher in the new age, which would be called the age of the Messiah. And we'll get to that in a moment. Just one more thing, since I know you're really interested in this God Magog stuff. Just, uh, uh, by the time of the Roman period, a legend uh, was attached to Gog and Magog, it's something known as the Gates of Alexander, which were created by Alexander the Great. Now, the gates referred to a mountain pass, an actual physical pass, uh, that was meant to be associated with Alexander the Great to prevent incursion of barbarian tribes. So this Gog-Magog myth carries on, and it's then tied in with the fact that Alexander had this actual physical barrier to keep out the barbarians, those who will do destruction. Um, and it became a symbolic boundary separating the civilized from the uncivilized world. So sometimes if you see in poetry, if T.S. Eliot, who's always using all sorts of biblical images, refers to something like Gog and Magog and Alexander, he's referring to this barrier between the civilized and the uncivilized, between the barbarian and the civilized. Um, the, the, the historian, the Roman Jewish historian Josephus, uh, knew these barbarians uh, had said they had descended from Magog the Japhite, as in Genesis, and said that they were now the Scythians, which was an ancient Iranian tribe. So they, the, and then over time, throughout the Middle Ages, this, the, who are the barbarians? They are the Vikings, the Huns, the Mongols. All sorts of different groups are then given to this uncivilized notion. But it all goes back to this Gog-Magog division um, if you're interested in historical connections. Okay, let's, let's move on. The Messiah in Judaism is a savior and liberator figure in Jewish eschatology who is believed to be the future redeemer of the Jewish people. So we've now entered the next age, the Messianic age. Even though the Jews have returned, okay, there's, it's, this isn't the end of things. Now we enter the Messianic age. Initially, as recorded in the Hebrew, Hebrew Bible, a Messiah is a king or a high priest of Israel, traditionally anointed with special holy anointing oil. So if you're anointed with, so there were many Messiah figures, small m. There were even some who were not exclusively Jewish. For example, the Hebrew Bible refers to Cyrus the Great. Cyrus was the Persian ruler, the Shah, who conquered Babylon and gave the Jews their liberation to go back to Israel. So you can may well see why he might be considered as a Messiah figure. He was the one who allowed for one of the, the return of these exiled Jews back to Israel. Um, by the second temple period, the term Messiah had come to refer specifically to a future king from the line of David. 
who was expected to save the Jewish nation and would be anointed with holy oil by the Jewish people. So when, we got to remember when this second temple period was. It was a period of approximately 600 years, 516 BCE to 70 CE. It's the time between the return after the exile to Babylon and the destruction of the second temple by the Romans. It's referred to as the second temple period because the second temple had been built. Um, in, it began with this return to Zion and then ended with the first Roman, war, Roman Jewish war. And the Messiah is now referred to as King Messiah. Because remember, during this period, what, the Jews are not in control of themselves. They're controlled by all sorts of foreign powers, okay? mainly the Greeks and the Romans. There had been a rebellion under the Maccabees, but that was later put down. So they're looking for a future redeemer to return Israel to a state, just as has it, more or less, as it had been returned after the exile. Um, he, and it was different views. Many thought he would be a world, worldly king and conqueror. He's going to be a man with a sword because the Romans aren't going away by saying, please go. <laughs> so it would be some warrior type. Other groups saw it more of a supernatural, eschatological savior figure something that was going to come from beyond, not a historical personage, something that was going to come down somehow at the end, that's why it's called eschatological, at the end and restore everything, so almost sort of magically. Okay? This wouldn't be a historical event. It would be some sort of eschatological, apocalyptic, supernatural event. Um, and this would be a savior figure. So according to uh, the Jewish scholar of religion, Zwi Zablowski, he said, the Messiah during this period no longer symbolized the coming of the new age, but he was somehow supposed to bring it about. He would be the cause of the new age. Could be historical, could be supernatural, but this would be the cause. The Lord's anointed thus became the Savior and Redeemer. And the focus was more on explicit arrivals of these figures. Before it had been kind of vague. But as the time grows near and things are not getting better, then there's this need to be much more explicit about what this Savior figure will be like. Uh, and there were, very many, there were different groups. You remember... Uh, Reverend Elbert has given a discussion of the various groups that were in part of the Jewish community. There were the Pharisees, there were the Sadducees, there were the Zealots, there were the Essenes. And the Essenes come to play a big role in this. You remember the Essene lecture that he gave? If not, it's, it's recorded somewhere. Um, this was a group uh, who practiced an apocalyptic faith. That meant the core of their belief was that the end was near. It was coming. It would be an apocalypse. That's what the apocalypse is. Um, and they looked back to uh, the contributions of what they called their teacher of righteousness. And forward to the coming of two and possibly three messiahs. So they, they sort of saw it as a stage process. There wouldn't be just one messiah. There would be an apocalypse in which three messiah. Now, what's interesting about this? Zoroastrian eschatology has three messiahs. Hmm. In any case, um, so they were very conservative, especially as regards the Jewish law. They didn't associate with anyone who was unclean or unpure. They were sort of like pure, the early Puritan movement, but way out there. So much so that they lived apart. And we know them, why they became famous is from the Dead Sea Scrolls. And you remember, this is uh, uh, 
this was one of the, these were their texts that were found at Qumran, which is their community down by the Dead Sea. They were they separated. They thought even the Sadducees and the, all the leaders of contemporary Judaism were impure, so impure that they moved away from Jerusalem. They moved down to their own community down by the Dead Sea. If you ever go to Israel, well, I don't know how that's looking these days, but uh, if you take that bus ride from Jerusalem right down the Dead Sea, you would stop at Qumran. Um, so they were very conservative, and they, uh, we know them a lot of their work through these Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, they disappeared after the, the first Roman-Jewish War. Why? <laughs> Romans get slaughtered them. <laughs> Either that or they left and went uh, Transjordan, which many Jews did. You know, what happens often in warfare, right? Refugees, they leave. I mean, so uh, many of them stayed, but many of them left. Um, it's interesting because some researchers suggest that Essene teachings may well have influenced some of the religious traditions of early Christianity. So one of the Dead Sea Scrolls, very interesting documents with messianic overtones, it's called the War Scroll, or the War of the Sons of Light against the Sons of Darkness. So the Essenes had that dualistic notion, good versus evil. When the apocalypse comes, it's the good versus the evil, who will win, the good, and then the kingdom of God will be established. Um, it refer, and it refers back to uh, the battle being led by the leader of the congregation. So they somehow saw themselves actively involved in this apocalyptic process. In fact, they probably interpreted their own existence in terms of this coming apocalypse in which they would then take part. And we, we find that in this war. It's also known as the pierced Messiah text. And it speaks of the stump of Jesse. And the stump of Jesse is a reference to the messianic line from the branch of David. So that's where we get a connection there. And the Messiah's soldiers, because this is going to be a battle, will clean the world of wickedness and all harmony will be restored and the end of time will be here. Messianic beliefs appear to have been part and parcel of the disciples' understanding of Jesus. Although Jesus refers to himself mainly as the Son of Man, there is this passage, which I'm sure you all have memorized, Matthew 16, 13 through 16. Would anyone like to get up and say it? No. Jesus came to the region of Caesarea and asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Um, and Jesus says, but what about you? Who do you say I am? And at that point, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So we have that early reference to Jesus as being the Messiah, the expected one. Unfortunately, he didn't fit into the tradition, most of the mainstream traditions of the Messiah. He wasn't a warrior king, and he wasn't dropping out of the sky. He was born in a stable. So, so anyway, and so this would become a very prominent belief of early Christian communities. He was the Messiah, which then caused a problem of explanation. How could the Messiah have been crucified? Which becomes an early uh, problem, which uh, I'm not going to deal with here, but we'll talk about next week. So, belief in the advent of the Messiah, if we go back to this period, it wasn't a mainstream idea. Well, it's sort of like today. There are elements within Christianity that focus on the end of times, but we wouldn't probably call them mainstream. We'd say that most groups say, yes, there is the second coming, but they're not planning for it. 
I don't think we're building anything prepared. So it wasn't, it was, fringe might be a little, but it wasn't the, the, main, the mainstream idea. Yeah, it's, it's it, smaller groups who really focus on these things, even though the body as a whole may accept them. All Jews would have said, okay, there will be a Messiah, but you know, who knows when. I mean, just like many Christians say, they believe in the coming, second coming of Christ, but probably not tomorrow. But some groups, you know, anyway. So th this is a common element within, uh, within Judaism within, and Islam as well, as, as we will see. In any case... Um, but by the 12th century, so we're moving now 1,200 years. This is after the Roman temple has been, I mean, the Jewish temples have been destroyed. Lots of Jews have left, have gone into the Mediterranean world, into Eastern Europe, etc. So by the 12th century, this famous uh, Jewish philosopher, one of the most famous medieval Jewish philosophers, Maimonides, said that belief in the Messiah is one of the fundamental requisites of the Jewish faith. Concerning about, which he wrote, anyone who does not believe in him or who does not wait for his arrival has not merely denied the other prophets, but has also denied the Torah and Moses. So nearly all Jews today believe the, in the Messiah. He just hasn't come yet, the Messiah. Now, and you may, as you get more towards Reform Judaism, it can be defined in different ways, but nearly all will accept that this is a basic doctrine of Judaism. The Messiah is a future, will come in the future. Now, it's important to recognize, if you think of this, if there's always this notion of the Messiah coming, you're probably going to get some what? Claims to Messiahship. And in fact, we know of some 30 different claims to Jewish messiahships over this period of time, from the early, early first century to the 20th century. There have been claims to messiahship. And it shouldn't be surprising in that it's a very essential idea within Judaism. And the messiah, it's always a hopeful, promising notion. Okay? So let's just look at a few of some of the more interesting ones. Uh, in the first century, this gentleman by the name of Bosithios, or also Nathan, both of which mean the gift of God, he was a Samaritan religious leader. Do you remember who the Samaritans were? They were a separate group that broke off from, uh, from, the, from Israel as opposed to Judah during the first conquest. And they were looked down upon by main, main, uh, mainstream Jews. Uh, he was the founder of a sect, and, uh, which was Gnostic in nature. If you remember anything about Gnosticism, very mystical. And uh, he was reputed to have known John the Baptist. That was his credential, <laughs> if, if you will. Um, the third century Christian scholar Origen of Alexandria who of course saw him as a heretic, says that he pretended to be the Christ. Now remember, Christ is the Greek word for Messiah. It wasn't Jesus' last name. Okay? Christ is a title. It's the Greek word for Messiah. Uh, and that he applied Deuteronomy 18.15 to himself which says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. He adds that Nathan's disciples pretended to possess books that were written by him and also claimed that he never suffered death but was still alive. This will be a common characteristic of many messianic figures. Jesus himself, okay, the Messiah who dies but doesn't die, okay, that's, this is, because this is the power of the Messiah. The Messiah can't die in that sense. He can't die perhaps physically in any case. Um, but a much more influential uh, 
claimed the messiahship was by Simon de Kochba. Uh, often just referred to as Bar Kochba. He was a military leader in Judea who initiated a revolt against the Romans. And the Romans didn't leave. They just destroyed everything and hung around. Uh, and this was in the year 132 CE. What's interesting about that date? Approximately 100 years after Jesus' crucifixion. This gentleman leads a, a revolt and he wins. He wins. Uh, and he's able to maintain a Jewish state for about three years. Now, do you see why that accomplishment might lead to his being claimed a Messiah? He's driven out the foreigners. He's returned uh, Israel to its, to its own power. Uh, like I said, they imagined for three years, and many Jews felt that this heralded the long hoped for messianic return. Mark Holkaba. Uh, he served as the state's leader, giving himself the title of Nasi, or prince. He subsequently proclaimed himself the Messiah and had the backing of the greatest sage of his time, a rabbi Akiva. So he had support from the Jewish leadership. He became known as Bar Koba, which means son of a star. Based on the verse in the Torah, Numbers 24, 17, that likens the Messiah to a shooting star. Interesting connection. Jesus, Bethlehem, star. And it's taken from the text. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. He will crush the foreheads of Moab and the skulls of all the people of Sheth. So this was his claim. He had won a victory. He was a king. He was fulfilling a lot of the uh, prerequisites of the Messiah. However, he was killed in 135 by Roman troops. Romans don't go away if they lose a battle. <laughs> they regroup, they came back, and all his rebels who remained after his death were also killed or enslaved within the next year. Their defeat was followed by a crackdown on the Judean populace by the Roman Emperor Hadrian. So there was another crackdown. One of the most fascinating, at least to me, claims for messiahship came from this gentleman, Zapata Zevi. He was a 17th century Ottoman, means Turkish, Jewish mystic and an ordained rabbi. In claiming to be the long-awaited messiah, he founded what is known as the Sabbatean movement, Zabate. Vast numbers of Jews in both the Middle East and Europe, especially the diaspora Jews of Eastern Europe, even as far away as France, believed in his claims. He was a very popular messianic figure. He planned to, make, he planned to take his claim to the Ottoman Caliph, Mehmed IV whom he believed and said would follow him. Hmm. However, upon arriving in the capital of Constantinople in 1666, he was imprisoned on the order of the Grand Vizier. So, he, he says the uh, caliph will convert. He turns out that he's in prison. In September of that year, after being moved around to various different prisons, he was taken to Adrianople to be judged on sedition. Because he is, a, uh, he's an Ottoman citizen. Uh, he was given the choice of either facing death 
by a not very nice ordeal or converting to Islam. What does the Messiah do? He converts to Islam. And turn, wears a turban from that point on. The heads of state rewarded him with a generous pension for complying with their political and religious plans. Despite his apostasy, and does anyone know what an apostate is? An apostate is someone who leaves one's religion. So, despite his apostasy from Judaism, many of his followers continued to believe he was the Messiah. And that apostasy was part of the messianic plan. It's very interesting how you can spin ideas, especially religious ideas. There was a book once written, it's called When Prophecy Fails. And it was looking primarily at the, the Jehovah Witnesses prophecy dates that fail. You would tend to think when that happens, well, <laughs> but ironically, often there's a surge in belief. And there has to be a reason it failed. There's some reason for this going on. In the, in the Jehovah's Witnesses case, it was that your faith wasn't enough. You didn't believe strongly enough, so God's called off the plan. Uh, in in Zevi's plan, uh, situation. Uh, he had 300 families who followed him and converted to Islam as part of what they saw of the messianic plan. However, the Ottomans eventually tire of him. They uh, hear him one night singing psalms with the Jews and they send him to a small town where he later dies in isolation. But the movement continued in large numbers well into the 18th century. But by the 19th century, it started to slowly die off. One explanation of what seemed to be an utter contradiction was that his apostasy was a test in the believer's faith. You can always call on that card. If things don't go right. And that's what happened. My friend just wrote a, uh, a study of this group, a very small number of them still existing in Turkey, who believe he was the Messiah. And that he wasn't dead. He was raised. Okay, the most recent claim to Messiahship is related to the person of Menachem Mendel Schneerson. 1902 to 1994. Seventh rabbi of the Chabad, Lubavitch, I don't know if you've heard of the Chabad, it was an Orthodox Hasidic movement founded in the 18th century. From his center in Brooklyn, New York, when you think of Messiahs, you think of the Middle East. <laughs> It's kind of a messiah in Brooklyn. Um, anyway, between 51 and 94, he transformed this Chabad movement to one of the most widespread Jewish movements in the world. Larry King, the, the, what, what would you call him? An announcer? Yeah, personality. Or personality was, was a member of the Chabad. Um, and uh, it, it sought to see, uh, fulfill Jewish religious needs, social needs, humanitarian needs across the Jewish world. Very large movement. Uh, he remained rather cryptic when it came to messianic assertions during his lifetime. Large numbers of his followers believed he was the Messiah. And many of them continued to believe this even after his death. Some went as far as to say, you should be able to fill in the blank, he hadn't really died. And he would return in due time. The return, the return. Okay, one last one briefly worth mentioning is uh, 
For some Zionists, not all, but for some, Israel, the state, is the Messiah. Not an individual, but a political reality, a political religious reality. Now, not all Zionists accept this, because Zionism has its own divisions. But some regarded, because, do you see, can you see how that could fit? Who returned the diasporic Jews to Israel? The Zionist movement, the state, and has continued to su support this idea of the Jewish uh, settlements. Okay. So let's just quickly look at the last two categories. That's been the, resur uh, the resurrection of the dead and the final judgment. An early mention of resurrection in Hebrew texts is the vision of the valley of dry bones in the book of Ezekiel, dated somewhere around 539 BCE. This leads some, let me see, more conservative thinkers to say that since that time, Jews have believed in the resurrection. Okay. However, Alan Siegel, professor emeritus of religion at Barnard College, argues the narrative was intended as a metaphor for national rebirth, promising the Jews return to Israel and reconstruction of the temple, not a description of personal resurrection. And that makes some sense given what we have saw before, you know, this idea that the Jews would return to their homeland. So it was a national rebirth. The book of Daniel, second century BCE, seems to promise resurrection to Jews. Siegel interprets the text as asserting that the coming of the archangel Michael would bring misery to the world and only those whose names were in a divine book would be resurrected. So a very select group, not universal resurrection. Moreover, Daniel's promise of resurrection was intended for only two groups, the most righteous and the worst of sinners. <laughs> because the afterlife was a place for reward for the very virtuous and punishment for the very sinful, everyone else, no resurrection. Anyway, it's been a very controversial theme in Jewish thought. If you speak to many Jews today, especially the Reformed Jews, they don't spend much time talking about the afterlife. They may say, okay, there is an afterlife or there isn't. What's important is how you live here. So there hasn't been the sort of the concern that you find both in Christianity and um, uh, Islam, for example, in this afterlife. But some will argue it's been around for a long time. And um, many scholars believe that probably the idea of the resurrection of the dead did come into Jewish thought during the Babylonian captivity because the Zoroastrians very much believed in this. Okay? At the end, there'd be a final judgment. You walked across a bridge which was thin as a razor blade. And if you weren't virtuous, you didn't step forward straight. <laughs> <laughs> You, uh, who wrote The Razor's Edge, um, Somerset Mom? It was sort of based on, uh, in any case. Uh, so it's been a very controversial issue. Uh, we know during the Second Temple period, there were those who believed in it and those who didn't. The Pharisees tended to believe in the resurrection. The resur the, the, these were more the lawyers, the scholars, whereas the Sadducees, the temple priests, didn't. They, they went back to the old tradition. Whereas the Pharisees had been very much influenced by other thought, Greek thought. We know that Paul, who had been a Pharisee, believed in the resurrection, or at least after his confrontation with the vision of Christ. During the rabbinic period, that's, was the, that's the Middle Ages, uh, beginning in the late first century and on, uh, the present, and I think, I think Elbert mentioned this, the works of Daniel were then included in the Hebrew Bible. Earlier they weren't. 
you, I, you, but they, by the second century, they were included, which gave some scriptural basis for resurrection. So those of the Jews who wanted to believe in the, in the resurrection could turn to this. The Mishnah, which is a, a, a collection of, of oral traditions, lists belief in the resurrection of the dead as one of the essential beliefs necessary for a Jew. So again, it, there's this sort of fluctuation. In general, it would seem that from the uh, second century on, there's been a general tendency to believe in a resurrection, but not to worry about it, not to detail it, uh, and not to put it as your main emphasis. Um, in contemporary Judaism, both Orthodox and conservative Judaism maintain the traditional belief in their liturgy. Uh, although many conservative Jews tend to use it metaphorically. Remember, you can always interpret these things literally or metaphorically. You can believe in the resurrection without having it be a literal physical resurrection. Finally, there is the last judgment. Now, in Judaism, the day of judgment happens actually every year on Rosh Hashanah. Therefore, the belief in a last day of judgment for all mankind is one, again, that is disputed. Some rabbis take the position there will be such a day following the resurrection of the dead. So those who believe in the resurrection of the dead also believe in a final judgment. Others hold that because of Rosh Hashanah, the last judgment only applies to Gentiles because the Jews experience this judgment yearly. Then there are others who hold that this accounting and judgment happens when one dies individually. This will be something we'll take up next week with Christianity. When people think of the, the early belief in Christian final judgment was one major event at the end of time. Everyone who had died until that point was as if you had just gone in for surgery to have your hip replaced, and they <laughs> put the, And if you know what that, that's the strangest thing, right? You're there, and then suddenly you're awake, and what happened to time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was sort of the belief that the final judgment would be one large event. I think... Large numbers of Christians today think of the final judgment as an individual thing that happens when you die. You die and then you go in front of whatever and there was the judgment. So that's how those ideas sort of morph over time. Originally, it's the final judgment was one event in which all persons who had ever lived would be resurrected and judged, whereas I think... Well, you can do a survey. Ask your friends if they believe in the final judgment. When does it happen? And I think a lot of people would say after, when you die, you go and you are somehow judged and the die is cast. Okay, that takes us to the end of uh, Jewish eschatology. Next week, we're going to turn to Christian eschatology. And I, I can't promise, but I can more or less promise I'll bring an outline but I, I'll try my best. Okay, any questions, concerns, thoughts? Well, if I were one of those guys that proclaimed themselves either through a vision or whatever, that they were the Messiah, mm -hmm. other than the one that was fighting wars, what in the world did they do all day? What did they do all day? They prayed, they preached, they traveled. Sabata Zevi traveled all over the Ottoman Empire. People, masses came, it was like a Billy Graham. And people came to hear him. Here was the Messiah. My God, why wouldn't you go? You're not going to watch the final four rather than, uh, you know, so they would go. Yeah, he traveled all over and he had followers. And uh, yeah, they were preparing for this big event. And so they were wondering, well, what's going to be the major sign? And if the Ottoman Caliph converts, that's a pretty good sign. So that's what he promised. And it <laughs> turned about to be the reversal. He converted. Yeah, he embarrassed. 
But you're right, Bar Kokhba really fit in many ways one of the ideal forms of the Messiah. He was a warrior. He drove out the Romans. He was uh, apparently a very religious man. He had the backing of the rabbis. What more could the Messiah want? But of course, then when you're killed a few years later by the Romans and they come back, and that's always the problem with messianic figures. If, if the end doesn't come, then what? <laughs> then you have to start reinterpreting. And we'll see that next week in, with Jesus, uh, Jesus and the idea of he was the Messiah. Why didn't universal peace come? Okay, thanks for coming. <laughs>